them have been driven to the brink of suicide. The Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has accepted 20 recommendations. These include asking every NHS organisation to identify one member of staff to whom other members of staff can speak to if they have particular concerns they're not being listened to. Julie Bailey founded the Cure the NHS group. She led the fight for an inquiry after her mother died at Stafford Hospital in 2007. She's told Sheila there needs to be careful consideration over who's put in place to support whistleblowers. It needs to be a, a, a really a strong, a certain type of person who can stand up to this bullying culture and speak up for the frontline staff. But it, it really depends who is appointed to that role. Claims that British spies asked for redactions to a US Senate report on torture to try to hide UK complicity have been ruled to be unfounded. The Intelligence and Security Committee has been looking at the allegations. The group of MPs and peers found the redactions were sought, but only on matters that were directly related to national security interests. The Unite Union has suspended two 24-hour bus strikes in London. Drivers were due to walk out on Friday and then again on Monday in a row over pay and conditions. LBC's Simon Conway reports. The 24-hour strikes on Friday and next Monday would have followed two previous walkouts in the last month. Unite is campaigning for a single pay and conditions agreement across 18 bus companies and says it's postponed the strikes in an act of goodwill. But the union is warning that the industrial action will be back on the cards if the bus firms don't join them for talks. Anti-terror police have made arrests in Merseyside and the West Midlands in apparently unrelated operations. A 31-year-old man was detained in the Liverpool area, while two women were held in the Walsall area this morning over Syria-related allegations. The leaders of Ukraine, France, Russia and Germany are to meet this afternoon to try to work out a peace deal for Ukraine. LBC's reporter in Moscow, Tom Barton, has more detail on what's expected in Minsk. The demilitarised zone certainly one of the main points that, that is due to be discussed and has already been discussed in preliminary meetings in Minsk. Whether it can work, though, whether especially these Russian-backed militants will want to give up the territory that they've won in recent fighting is a very big question mark. Firefighters across England are to stage another 24-hour strike over their long-running row of the pensions. The Fire Brigades Union hasn't announced a date for the walkout, but says it will be in the coming weeks. And free Wi-Fi is to be rolled out on trains from 2017. The Prime Minister set out plans for a £50 million investment. The plans will cover services operated by TSGN, Southeastern, Chiltern and Arriva Trains Wales. LBC weather, dry through the afternoon with some sunny intervals possible in London and the southeast, a high of 6 Celsius, cloudy across the rest of England, Wales and Scotland, light rain for parts of central England and Northern Ireland, otherwise staying dry. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Rupert Bartia. Hello and welcome aboard your East Coast train. Calling at smoked salmon and dill sandwich, chicken tikka masala, emmental and mushroom crock, and finally stopping at Spanish Cabernet Sauvignon. With a new complimentary food and drink menu on East Coast trains for first-class travellers and the food bar in standard, we're pulling out all the stops to make you feel at home. So next time you need to travel, why not try it the East Coast Trains way? Book today at eastcoast.co.uk. This is LBC, leading Britain's conversation with Sheila Fogarty. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Sheila Fogarty on LBC. Hello, good afternoon to you. Uh, Grant Shapps, the Conservative Party chairman, is with us between now and 3.30 to take your calls. Um, I'm conscious, actually, the two or three times we've already done this, that I haven't fitted in as many calls as I'd like, uh, because we only have you, we only have you for half an hour, don't yeah, we? so we, we have to do dead yeah. short answers. So, well, <laughs> short answers, short questions, and I'll ask fewer questions in the first half hour as well to get as many of your calls in as possible uh, on any subject you like, including rapping. I'll tell you why in a minute. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Grant Shapps, Conservative Party Chairman and MP for Well in Hatfield. Never leave out the constituency. Taking your calls. So you're a bit of a rapper. Ah, the secret's out there. <laughs> How did that slip out? <laughs> oh, sorry. And I, I said I wouldn't say, but Only I couldn't in resist it. Only in private. Only in private. Well, it's yeah. more than in I karaoke. can say. I was claiming earlier that I was, but I wasn't. <laughs> um, on much more serious matters and, and really current, actually, uh, Jeremy Hunt, your, your colleague, the Health Secretary, uh, gave a statement in the Commons this lunch hour. I think we can. Can we hear a little bit of what he said? Let's have a listen to what he said, first of all. 
but the whole House will be profoundly shocked at the nature and extent of what has been revealed today. The only way we will build an NHS with the highest standards is if doctors and nurses who have given their lives to patient care always feel listened to if they speak out about patient care. The message must go out today that we are calling time on bullying, intimidation and victimisation which has no place in our NHS. No, I, I spoke to two campaigners mm. um, a little earlier, both of whom were quite optimistic, actually, that the health secretary um, and the government is, is taking this by the scruff of the neck and, and taking Robert Francis's um, information and, and running with it. But an awful lot, lot of people then rang in uh, who either currently work or used to work in the NHS and they don't share the same optimism. Well, I think that this is probably the first time that there's been a secretary of state who has just made it absolutely clear that the culture which can lead to um, these types of things being covered up absolutely is at an end and has to end and that, that there's going to be steps make, taken to make sure that that happens. And if you look at some of the upshot of the sort of bullying, the covering up, the problems faced by whistleblowers, which led to you know tr- tragedies like uh, mid-staffs, thousands of patients died and people were trying to blow the whistle. And nobody was listening, least of all the government of the day, who refused to carry out any reviews or investigations into it at all. So Jeremy Hunt, the health secretary, very, very clear in that clip you just heard. That's unacceptable. I can understand why people working within the health service would still say, OK, mm, need to see that happen. But they need to know they've got a, a government and a secretary of state in, of, for health there who's totally on their side if they want to reveal things happening one in of, the NHS. One of the things that, that stood out for me um, when he was talking about the measures that will be taken as well as the measures that have already been taken is... Um, to, to try to bring legislation to protect whistleblowers from discrimination um, right from the point of, of when they that they make the complaint, but specifically when they apply for a new job further down the line. Um, we've had uh, this, te- I won't reread it, but this text here I have in front of me from Sarah, who was three months from qualifying as a nurse mm. and now works in a shop simply because she tried to uh, whistleblow. Uh, do you know, I have people come to my constituency surgery in my well in Hatfield constituency and they'll say to me, I've got these serious concerns. I've had this happen. I've got these serious concerns. But I'm more frightened of reporting it than I am about, uh, uh, you know, keeping quiet. And that is a cultural problem that needs to be tackled. Now, I don't think this is everywhere in the NHS, but it's clearly been too widespread in the past. As I say, I think it's really important that the, the word goes out from the top to the bottom of the NHS. If you have concerns, you can come forward with those concerns. Your concerns will be taken seriously and it won't impact on your job going forward. It's it's not directly related, or maybe some people might argue that it is. Um, and this is the final question for me for now, and we'll go to calls in just a second. But um, I think it was raised as well in the House of Commons this lunchtime in, in Prime Minister's questions. You can talk about a culture in the NHS and talk about having a, a health secretary who's who's really supportive. Um, and yet the recommended 1% pay rise for nurses is not being implemented uh, yet who knows down the line but um that can't help with culture that can't help with a sense that the government is behind you if you're a you know a hard-working nurse in an nhs hospital look no one's denying that times have been incredibly tough we had the biggest crash in our you know nation's history back in 2008 9 when six seven percent of the economy was wiped out in one fell swoop despite that we've managed to put more money into the nhs about 12.7 billion pounds now i'd love lots of that money to go to paying people more as well. Um, the the truth is that there's always a decision to be made between whether you can employ more doctors and nurses, of which we have many thousands more, fewer managers, which we have 7,000 less and more, you know, you know, sort of midwives and things, or whether you increase the salary bill and what's a very large organisation. But when I do think that... as times improve, you know, obviously there are, there's, there's better opportunities and with inflation low, thank goodness pay rises are now running ahead. Of Just briefly, when might that no pay rise be be reviewed? Well, look, the, the, there's a recommendation made um, every year and then the, um, the, the, the health secretary uh, reviews that. One of the things which um, I think everyone will have noticed is we've now got an economy which is growing faster than any other in Europe, actually any other in the developed world, and low inflation. So it is at last meaning that even with the lower pay increases, that actually 
that is ahead of inflation for the first time. So, look, as the economy improves, I, I think the answer is um, hopefully on the horizon. Whereas if we throw this all away and we go backwards, back to the bad old days, tax borrowing spend, you know what I'm going to say. I do. We'll have to live through I this do. all you're again. Find and a, we you're going to have to find a new there. way of saying it sometime. <laughs> uh, 03456060973. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC if you want to put a question to Grant Shapps, Conservative Party Chairman. Jack has called from York. Hi, Jack. Hi. Hi, what was your question? Uh, uh, my question is, uh, we're living in crazy times of ISIS burning a Jordanian pilot last week. My question is, does Grant support King Abdullah of Jordan's response to rack up the pressure on ISIS and let them know that the Middle East will no longer stand by idle, with their actions growing more atrocious by mm. the week? Mm. Was this because the, the, the king said he would go and personally fight? I think I, I heard uh, yeah. the quote, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, look, I mean, what happened with that burning of the Jordanian pilot was just beyond horrific and horrendous. It's, it's hard to believe there are people in this world who kind of think that's the way to achieve any aim at all. It's barbaric behaviour. And, um, you know, we stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with uh, Jordan in this fight because Britain is, uh, you know, really putting in a lot of effort uh, in this fight against ISIL. We're the second biggest contribu- contributor, for, for example, to the airstrikes. Um, and the, what we're doing in terms of airstrikes are our pilots, therefore, putting themselves at, at, at some risk in the same way as that Jordanian pilot was at risk. Our pilots are carrying out more of the bombing raids than France, Belgium, Australia and several other countries put together. The Netherlands, several other countries put together. So we're really in there and we're really committed to this but, fight. But what about and we that, must be. But what about, the, I think, was it the Defence Select Committee saying that we had a, I, I, I hope I'm getting the words right, strikingly small Well, I was really struck, contribution. I was really struck by that because, as I say, I mean, you know, our contribution is, is bigger than other countries who are putting in military effort. I'm not just talking about the ones who've said, oh, we'll provide some, grout, some, some, some logistical support. I'm talking about France, who are carrying out raids, Australia, the Netherlands. Our effort is bigger than uh, five or six of the next, yeah, of the next countries put together. But yeah, plus of course we've also got refueling planes. We've also got uh, aircraft which are uh, pilotless. Did they get that wrong? Yeah, I think they just got it wrong. Yeah, yeah, genuinely, I think you know actually, uh, in fact, we were having a look at this in cabinet on uh, Tuesday, uh, and we were reviewing. Um, some of the uh, some of the British military expertise, the equipment that's in there, and our contribution is really very sizable, second only to the United States. Okay, uh, Jack, you, do you do you support what King Abdullah has said and done? Are, are you hopeful that other Middle East countries will will do more? Oh yes, I think it's about time that uh, as we do have to support the Middle East, but also I think the only way to get peace in the Middle East is for countries in the Middle East to start policing themselves rather than relying often too heavily on intervention from Western powers. Although I do support that when there's such atrocities going on that we can't stand, stand idle as uh, one human to another cannot let people be burned in the streets, people be thrown off uh, buildings and that because if we just let that happen, it's even by not doing anything, it seems that we're almost accepting it and yeah. I wouldn't want to live in a world where that is accepted that another human can do that with someone. Thank you very much, Jack, for your call. Jack in York. I must admit, watching all of the stuff and listening to and speaking to lots of people during um, Holocaust Memorial Day and mm. the week around that, um, put all of that Islamic State stuff in, in, in sort of the forefront of my mind as well. I was thinking, well, look how much of, of that was ignored. Yeah, well, absolutely. Years ago. I mean, I, I always think that the Holocaust, the difference, anyone who's been to visit Auschwitz or one of the other concentration camps will notice the big difference there was factories were set up to murder people. But what we've got with ISIL at the moment is a situation which is as barbaric in terms of the individual acts, putting a man in the cage and burning him, throwing people off um, buildings and the rest of it. Let's not let them get to the point where they set up factories to murder people. The world should have learnt those lessons and we stand by at our peril. So I, I, I'm very proud of the Britain's contribution and of our very brave pilots who are flying saucies right now. They'll be in the air um, actually flying those saucies over Iraq. But I'm told only 6% of those saucies our, our RAF. Well, actually, one of the... I, I, I don't know about that um, percentage, actually, um, but one of the things that we do is to do great reconnaissance. So the big issue is finding the targets. Um, we have very good expertise in finding those targets um, using pilotless aircrafts, the drones and things, as well as our own reconnaissance and actual um, aircraft. They're in the skies constantly, and our effort and our our work. Um, by the way, it's been you know pra- praised, for example, by President Obama, who's very much um, uh, in favour of what we're doing. And do you know the scale of special forces, British special forces involved as well? Well, I don't want to go into that too much because um, 
you know, clearly um, some of this is, uh, you know, with the kind of enemy that we have here, um, but best not discussed on, on sort of public radio. But it is absolutely the case that we are providing first class support to the Iraqi government who are now trying to be much more inclusive uh, and uh, uh, you know, need to be, as your caller just said, need to be the final, the, the actual, you know, in the end, you need to have um, the governments on the ground sorting this problem out. Let's just pause for uh, the travel news now, but we'll go to Deborah in Usley straight after that. It's 3.15. I'm Joanne Webb in the LBC Travel Centre in London. It's very slow on the North Circular Road westbound to Hall Lane at Walthamstow and that's because a car has broken down. In Waltham Abbey in Hertfordshire, the A121 Honey Lane is closed in both directions. That's after an accident. In Hampshire on the M3, the southbound exit slip road is closed at junction 6. Now that's the exit for the A30 at Basingstoke and that's after a car was on fire earlier. In Lincolnshire, the A153, that's the ball ring, that remains closed in both directions in Horncastle following a serious accident. The air ambulance had to land earlier. That's now gone, but I'm afraid the road remains closed in both directions. In the West Midlands, there are problems on the M6 northbound. One lane is closed at Junction 8 at the M5 because a car has broken down. Keeping you moving, your next travel updates in half an hour. This is LBC. A lollipop lady from Crosby crosses the road for a shock ice. A vicar from Pontypris picks up a new teapot. A chief inspector from Basildon buys a magnifying glass. And a bird watcher from Bath buys a feather duster. Every second, everyday Britons touch and pay with Visa Contactless. Pay quickly and easily with Visa Contactless today. Payments under £20, bank terms apply. The wheels on the bus don't go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus don't go round and round all day long. If your commute is driving you round the bend, try video meetings using Citrix GoToMeeting to meet colleagues face-to-face from home. You'll save time, money and your sanity. Start your free 30-day trial now. Visit gotomeeting.co.uk. The people on the bus are now late for work. Late for work. Mum? Mum? Yes? There are penguins in my room. Nobody wants to wake up to a chilly home. So it's good to know that if your boiler breaks down, British gas experts are here for a one-off repair or ongoing care. To find out more, call 0800 009 4620 or search British Gas. Conditions and exclusions apply. It's that time of year again. Time to turn the lights down low, light the candles and be seduced by a dazzling French model. Like the Renault Clio, with up to £1,500 deposit contribution at 6.9% APR representative during Renault romance season. Ooh la la. 6.9% APR representative, ordered and registered by 31st of March 2015 at participating dealers only. Finance provided by Renault Finance, subject to status and over 18s. T's and C's apply. See renault.co.uk slash offers. He'll happily spend £90 on jeans or trainers, or £500 on a phone that can say if it's raining in Acapulco, which it never is. I thought my son didn't understand the value of money until he said we could save £750 on his car insurance with Ingenie. £750? A father-son trip to that Ibiza, maybe? Show off my moves. Ingenie customers say we saved them £750 on average. See how much you could save at Ingenie.com. Ingenie. Insurance for 17 to 25s. Drive well, pay less. Sheila Fogarty on LBC. Grant Shapps is here with us, Conservative Party Chairman and MP for Well in Hatfield. Uh, to take your calls, 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC Deborah from Usley. Hello, Deborah. Good afternoon. I tweet for Disability Politics UK, which is campaigning to get more disabled people into politics. Mm. And Dr Sarah Wollaston and Robert Halfon from the Conservative Party, both MPs, support one of our campaigns. Today, I'd like to ask Grant Shapps about another aspect. Um, We need, disabled people need MPs to have accessible constituency offices so that Mm. disabled people can volunteer and do paid work for MPs to get on the first step of the ladder towards getting into politics. And I'd like to ask Grant if he would ask all Conservative parliamentary candidates to commit to getting accessible constituency offices if they get elected, and also to ask him if his office is accessible, and if not, 
would he please make sure that he can get an accessible office? Well, the answer is is, is yes and yes, in which case, um, Deborah, um, that there, actually, interestingly, we've been discussing it in my constituency office in the last um, week. We have a problem with the building, which was constructed in the early 70s, when I'm afraid no one was looking at these issues um, at all. And so we've put a, a kind of a special system protocol, if you like, in place to make sure that constituents want to um, see me. We check and we've got ramps available and that sort of thing. But actually, ultimately, we don't even think that's uh, enough. So so yes, it's accessible, but it should be better. Uh, but we don't think that's enough. And we're actually going to rebuild it. And we were discussing those plans with regard to making sure that it's fully um, you know, compliant and we're able to get people in and out much more easily. But I also do other things like arrange to meet people at their homes, because often that's much easier uh, within my constituency. But I'm very, very happy to take that message forward. I'm pleased you're working with people like uh, Robert Halfen, um, in the, the MP in Harlow, um, and Dr. Sarah Wollaston down in, um, in the Southwest, because they're great champions for these um, issues as well. But no, I'm very happy to take it forward. And as I say, it's something that I've personally been discussing only the last week. How, how disenfranchised, uh, Deborah, do you think some disabled people are? Well, the, if, if disabled people were to be properly represented in the House of Commons, there'd be 65 disabled MPs. But mm. as it is, there's only a handful of MPs who've outed themselves as disabled. Whereas with um, gender and race, MPs, you can ring the House of Commons Information Service and they will tell you how many MPs there are. With disability, despite the UN Convention, which requires the government to collate statistics, MPs haven't voluntarily decided to monitor whether or not they're disabled and to tell the House of Commons Information Office. So I would welcome it if Grant would also encourage all MPs to say, yes, I'm disabled, because we'd know we were being better represented then. Mm. Well, certainly you've got some great advocates as well there. Uh, people, I'll just say, because people won't necessarily know if they don't happen to live in Harlow, for example, uh, Robert Halfen, who um, has been disabled all his uh, life, is a brilliant MP campaigns on a whole range of you know just every kind of consumer subject, but also a great advocate in these sort of areas as well. And I do agree with you. I mean, this is my my big push as Conservative Party chairman is to try to select candidates who actually represent the country as it actually is in terms of the number of women. We've selected many, many more women for the selection. No, we're up to like thirty five, thirty six percent. Yeah, we do because you want to get to fifty percent um, people from from different minority backgrounds. There, actually, in this next election, we're up to. I think 18 to 20 percent so we're sort of uh, getting up there but are uh, you right as well you want people with all sorts of different backgrounds including people who uh, will have different types of disabilities because they'll better be able to represent okay. the population as large. Deborah I hope you're happy with those answers that's Deborah and Usley. Uh, Gerard um, in Crewe in Cheshire we've had calls from Northumberland Yorkshire and now Cheshire uh, let's not forget LBC's gone national. That's why we love it. That's why we love it. Um, I think it goes very national when we tend to have a government minister in for a bit of a grilling so fire away Gerard. I don't think he'll love this. <laughs> Try I, I, me. I know what it's about. He doesn't, yeah. <laughs> well, two nights ago, Grant, you held a fundraiser for the rich and famous. Now, I want you to know that as a natural conservative voter, this has made my life so difficult with other colleagues when you go pimping yourself out and government ministers out. Well, he didn't. To be fair, he didn't. I was asking no, him why he didn't. What the party did. What the party did. I'm speaking to Grant as a representative of my party. Ah. Uh-huh. So it, it looks corrupt, it looks cheap, and it looks like you just represent the 1% and not the 99% of us who are out there struggling, making, finding life quite difficult. None of us that I know can bid £200,000 for a game of tennis or a holiday or a day out with Theresa May shopping at shoes, God forbid. But it just makes my life difficult on the street when I'm trying to sell your message. OK, well, Gerald, look, we have two options in this country. Um, Either we can go for taxation to pay for politics. That means that everyone listening to this programme would be paying for political parties. I struggle to think of a more unpopular policy, uh, even if I were (laughs) were trying. And that is the other option. Or we have political parties that have to meet their own ends, make ends meet, raise the money on their own. And to reassure you, you know, ordinary party members in this country are actually the ones who raise about 17, 18 million pounds a year, just in membership, just in, in small amounts of money, in constituencies throughout the um, country. 
there's an election coming and actually elections cost some money to, to fight. People who want to support the, um, the the Conservative Party, who want to make sure that we have a Conservative government, are up against an enormous union baron machine. Where, yeah. well, look, just in the last couple of weeks, one well, union gave several million... So, sorry, one second. In the last couple of weeks, one union gave millions, millions to the Labour Party. Not because the members of that union wanted it to happen, because the union baron at the top wanted it to happen. That's what we're up against. We don't do that. What we say is, look, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have made money in life, well done to you. If you want to support the democratic process, brilliant. But by the way, you won't get to select our candidates, well, you won't Unite get to select policy, union. Can I just and come you in won't here? get Unite. to choose our leader. Unite. And that's the difference I'll between us and Labour. I'll be back in a second, Gerard. Unite is the union I think you're referring to. Yes. They gave a 1.5 million, I think it was, um, to Labour. The latest contribution. But, yeah, okay, but they said the reason for that was they didn't want Labour to be left swinging while your party was given huge donations from big business. So you're both well, hold on. As, as, uh, hold on. As the Financial Times has revealed today, the number of uh, donations to Labour not from unions has plummeted since Ed Miliband's been in power. Hold on. This is really important. So nearly all of the funding is coming from big union barons who are not doing what the members of the unions uh, want to happen. I know lots of union members who are Conservatives or support other parties. They are simply buying Labour's votes, their candidates, and, by the way, they installed Ed Miliband as leader. I'll tell you what, I'd rather have people who want to contribute contributing, and that includes millions of people who give very small amounts of money to the Conservative Party and actually makes up the bulk of our funding. But unions are made up of individuals. And, sure. And Ed Miliband has made it clear but they don't what get that a choice. relationship with the party is no. going to be. Here's the thing to understand, though. They don't get that choice where that money goes. Now, I think it would be fair if when you join a union, you say, yeah, I want to pay my subscription to the union for political funds and I'll choose which party it goes to. No, no, that's not what happens. That money comes out into a general political fund and then the Unite boss, the Baron, will make the decision where it goes. It has nothing to do with the union members. OK, Jared, thank you for your call. I'm going to move on. Apologies, Jared. I'm going to m move on because we have lots of calls to get through. Rob in Putney wants to talk about um, donations to India. Do you, mean, do you mean aid donations, Rob? Yeah, international development aid budget. The £12 billion pounds that we currently donate um, to, which is very laudable. Um, there was just a piece in the, in the news today about uh, uh, that, um, our continuing commitment to pay India £250 million pounds between now and 2019. Well, well, India spends £600 million pounds a year on their uh, space budget, uh, sending rockets into space. Um, where's the sense in justifying the 0.7% GDP um, of international development aid when we're having to cut 40 billion of public services. I mean, we need you're asking the Metropolitan Police to cut 600 million off their budget um, in the next parliament. Okay, okay, you get in. okay, Rob. Well, look, I know the aid budget is um, controversial. Sometimes it may appear like it's difficult to justify, but uh, I'll give it a go. One of the things that we've done with our aid budget, for example, is to fight Ebola, probably one of the, the, the strongest of any country in the world preventing it in the end coming here and costing us millions or even billions if it really had got gotten um, out of control. We were able to do that at source uh, in countries like Sierra Leone because we have that facility to, to help. So I think it actually ends up saving us money. In addition, um, you're right about countries like you know, China or India who are becoming very developed and we're withdrawing the aid budgets um, from those um, countries. Uh, but I think it is actually in our own self-interest because it, ex it in many ways extends our reach around the world. Britain is known in many places in the world and guess what? A lot of countries therefore end up having relationships with us trading with us. We get more jobs at home as a result. We are a global country and, and we have um, I think a global reach in part because of it. But you're right it needs to be spent wisely. I don't disagree with you there. Brief response Rob? Um, I just think with the general election upcoming um, I'd be more interested in keeping £600 million pounds in the Metropolitan Police budget when we have terrorists running around shooting people than extending hands around the world. You've got to think of your electorate and the people who are meant to be voting for you. If it was uh, just otherwise, a... you're going to get Tories like me voting for UKIP just to give you guys a bloody nose. Yeah, but you'll end up with getting a middle band in Downing Street. Look, on the terrorism fund, a lot of the work that we do through, for example, the aid budget prevents terrorism coming to our shores. So if you're, you know, if the argument is how do we stop people becoming radicalised and coming here, a lot of the work that we do, which includes things like schooling, make sure that Britain doesn't end up getting uh, attacked because we tackle it at the source. Just before you go, can I ask you about? Um 
all these calls this week, or the, there were many calls this week, for um, an earlier referendum on the EU. Ken Clark says he'd be comfortable with it. Boris Johnson says he'd be comfortable with it. Would you be comfortable with it? I mean, the Prime Minister has himself said, look, if, it, if you could get everything done sooner, then, then, then more's the better. But we want to be realistic with the British people. We're going into this election. The Conservatives are the only party going to offer a referendum. We've said it has to happen before the end of 2017. If it can happen earlier in the year, then, then great. But it actually requires renegotiation. It requires a law to be passed to hold the referendum. So let's be realistic and upfront with people and say, look, we expect it to take time, but the only way you can get that referendum is to vote for David Cameron and the Conservatives at the but election. But the renegotiation period inevitably is not going to be quick, is it? Well, that's law, why Law is hardly ever quick. Look, look passing laws, unfortunately, is a, <laughs> quite a long-winded process. That's one of those things. We have to go through that. You've got to do the renegotiation and we want to be straight with people. So we're not trying to pretend that you can sort of just get this all done in six months, or whatever. We're saying to people, look, we know um, that it will take some time to do the renegotiation to give people the in out of Europe choice. And we will make sure we do that before the end of 2017. Prime Minister has already said if we can do it any earlier, all the better. But that's our commitment. OK, many thanks. I'm glad we got through more calls this time. Yeah, uh, great. We're, we're getting the hang of this, uh, Grant Shapps. Thank you very much indeed, Grant Shapps, Conservative Party Chairman. And... Uh, MP for well in Hatfield. Thanks a lot for coming in. Thank you. Um, 0345 If you want to uh, discuss anything you heard from Grant Shapps, uh, call that number. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. It's 3.30. Let's get the headlines from Rupert Bhatia. The government is to fast-track laws to protect people who speak out about poor care in the NHS. It follows a report on whistleblowing by Sir Robert Francis. It found that thousands of staff have been bullied after raising concerns. The review found that some have been driven to the brink of suicide. Up to 300 people are feared dead after boats carrying migrants sank in the Mediterranean. Four boats left Libya on Sunday. Two 24-hour strikes planned by... 